my name is Daniel Parathon. Thank you so much for having me today. Um, I'm really happy to be here giving this guest lecture on a overview of DeFi, Xerox protocol, and the Xerox API. And just really quickly, a little bit about me. I'm a software engineer at Xerox. I've worked at Xerox for a year now. And before that, I used to work for an online dating company, and uh, which is called Coffee Meets Bagel. Aside from that, a few things about me. I help organize a meetup called SF Python, which is the uh, Python meetup in San Francisco. And uh, if you ever want to present your Python project or you want to learn more Python, please let me know. You'll have my contacts at the end. I'm originally from Italy, even though I've lived in the Bay Area for around five years. And I'm pretty obsessed with cycling. This is me cycling close to Berkeley, actually, which is an amazing place to be there. And I can't express how, how grateful I am to be here today giving this lecture. I've actually attended a few uh, Blockchain at Berkeley events in the past. And I still remember when I was inside some of those classrooms on a Sunday trying to understand the Lightning Network together with Max Fang. And uh, the truth is, I still don't know the, the Lightning Network well, but uh, I made a lot of friends, which is really great. So just so we make sure we we're on the same page. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about a couple of things. First of all, we're gonna go and do an overview of what DeFi is, decentralized finance. And then we're gonna go and dig deeper into one use case of decentralized finance, which is decentralized exchanges, specifically the Xerox protocol. And then we're actually gonna get pretty practical. So we're actually gonna be building our own exchange UI and using uh, the Xerox API which is a very, very simple API to, to uh, swap tokens. And then yeah, your, your favorite thing, there'll be homework. So um, yeah, I'll be giving you a small assignment. So let me start with a bold statement. All forms of value will be eventually represented as tokens. The centralized financial system is just not holding the test of time. It's slow, there's a lot of red tape, it only permits the most traditional forms of value and access to financial services may depend on where you were born or where you lived. So it is pretty unfair. This comes at a time where more and more things are being tokenized on top of the blockchain. You see traditional forms of value such as fiat currencies or stocks of public companies on the blockchain. But you're also seeing different types of, of forms of value emerge, such as voting power, labor, video game items, collectibles. And as we see this process of tokenization continue and evolve, these two standards have emerged in the Ethereum world. We have ERC-20 and ERC-721 or NFTs. And I know you have covered ERC-20 a few lectures ago, but just as a refresher, ERC-20 tokens are fungible tokens. That, that means that they're interchangeable, right? So what that means is, as an example, two $5 bills are equals to one $10 bill. They're pretty much the same. Non-fungible token is different. It's where every asset has unique attributes. Um, think, think collectibles like Pokemon cards, where one Pokemon card is not equal to an, any other Pokemon card. Car, um, assets are their, their value derives by their unique attributes. So we these type of collectibles include things like domain names, or uh, fundraising, or even CryptoKitties, which is a fun game. And as these standards emerge, there is a need for the creation of a open and more efficient global financial system that includes and is able to create markets across all of these token types. And this is why I'm here today, which is to give you an overview of what DeFi is or decentralized finance. And um, probably the best way to start is with a small video. And I apologize if there may be a little lag, but uh, without further ado, let's go. Traditional finance and decentralized finance. What you need to know. What is traditional finance? It's what we're used to, like banks and other financial institutions that act like the middleman. There's you, the middleman like your bank, some form of payment channel like Visa or MasterCard, 
the recipient's bank, and the recipient. Now, what's decentralized finance? It essentially accomplishes the same purpose as traditional finance, but without the financial institution. There's you and the recipient. No middleman, and a transaction is done on the blockchain. What is a blockchain? A blockchain is an immutable timestamp series record of data that is distributed and managed by a cluster of computers. There are many aspects of the blockchain we can dive into, but we'll save that for another video. So what is the difference between traditional finance and decentralized finance? Let's look at the trust source. The trust source for decentralized finance is public blockchains. Records are kept simultaneously across thousands of computers where all transactions are publicly auditable. There is no core authority. Every participant in the network can access the history of transactions. While traditional finance trust source is public governance framework composed of laws, licensed financial institutions, and financial authorities. There is a core authority which only privileged users or institutions can access. Another difference are barriers. Decentralized finance is a more open system, meaning it's more transparent and doesn't have many barriers, which allows for innovation and ease of entry. Unlike traditional finance, which is heavily regulated, we are still in the early days for the use of digital ledger technologies. This concept of decentralized finance shows mass potential and has what it takes to revolutionize the financial sector. All right, cool. So thank you Stably for this video. Let's get back into the presentation. So essentially what, what this video is saying is that these particular financial institutions that are seen in this video are being replaced by a set of public smart contracts that exist on a single blockchain, which in our specific case is the Ethereum blockchain. And because of that, there are some interesting shifts in mentality for the consumers like, like me and you who access these services. So I'm going to name a few of them. The first thing is users hold custody of their own funds. And just to make sure we're on the same page, I just wanna, just wanna mention a couple of terms here. So we're gonna use the term wallet, which you may have heard. Wallet is a place where you can store your digital money, like Ethereum or other tokens. And then we're going to using the term custody. Custody refers to who holds your wallet. Most services will fall into two types of buckets. You'll have custodial services, like a centralized exchange, and like Coinbase Pro, right, holds your funds. It holds your funds for them. So they, they take custody of them. And then there's non-custodial, which is when you own your own private keys. And what does it mean the users hold custody of their own funds? Well, when you trade on Coinbase, right, you deposit and entrust Coinbase with your assets. And I'm sure Coinbase has amazing security, but Unfortunately, there have been situations in the past where centralized exchanges have been hacked or they have been, you have been denied service as a user or the exchanges went down for operational reasons. In comparison, when you trade on a decentralized exchange using a non-custodial wallet, right? You always use a non-custodial wallet on decentralized exchanges. Instead of depositing your funds into someone's smart contract or someone's account, you give smart contracts the right to withdraw a pre-approved number of tokens from your wallet. So what does that mean? That in general, tokens always live into your wallet. And only during a trade, those tokens are swapped by those smart contracts for the duration of that transaction. And also, when I mentioned before that we give exchanges a pre-approved number of tokens, that's what we called an allowance, right? So we effectively approve a smart contract to withdraw a determined amount of funds from our wallet. Well, these allowances can be revoked at any time. They're actually really easy to revoke. And as part of this presentation, as part of the demo, we'll, we'll be doing that too. Second thing I want to talk about is related to governance. So DeFi applications strive to be decentralized. And what that effectively means is we're trying to give governance to the community. And how do we do this? Well, many applications 
create some specific sets of voting mechanisms, which usually involve tokens, to give accountability to users, allowing them to effectively drive the direction of a specific product. In the example here, we have Xerox's V3 version of, of the protocol, which is put up a vote, at a vote. And 99% of people agreed to proceed with the direction of deploying V3. Now, I know what you may be thinking, like 99% is a pretty crazy number. But the truth is, as of today, most of these DeFi applications are still being developed and, and supported by a small community of individuals, right? We're still in extremely early phases. But because many of these DeFi applications are thinking, you know, 10, 20 years down the line, they, they want to set up governance for success today so that tomorrow they won't be the owners of these protocols, but it'll be the entire community. And the consequence of this, this governance is it creates this beautiful idea of DeFi apps being like a public good that anyone can use. Another important thing is around composability. So what this means is DeFi applications, so let me, let me make a preface. So DeFi applications are accessible by anyone they live on the same blockchain, in this case, the, the, the Ethereum job blockchain. And there is no sign up process. You don't have to like register an account to use these protocols. And because of this, the benefits are obvious for developers, right? You can build on top of other existing applications. Let me give you an example. Let's say you were building like a front end application today you wouldn't rebuild jQuery or you wouldn't rebuild React. You would use, you would import jQuery and React. And the reason why you would do that is because you'd get all the community support from the developers, great documentation. You would get Stack Overflow and you would also have less bugs, right? Most importantly, you would be able to build your product quicker and go to market quicker. And this is the same thing with DeFi applications. You can think of DeFi apps as like small micro frameworks that do one thing and they do it really well. And so other DeFi applications can effectively be built on top of existing DeFi applications and interact with them. And obviously this creates like a really, really beautiful ecosystem of, uh, you know, many DeFi apps connecting to other DeFi apps. And I, I, you know, we like to think about this as money Legos, right? You can plug and play different, different pieces. So let's look at an example as a comparison, right? Traditional exchanges and decentralized exchanges. So very briefly, even because we've mentioned many of these things, traditional exchanges have a risk of being hacked, right? If you get, if you, if you are hacked, you lose all your money. Then there's a risk of downtime, right? Especially when markets are really, really volatile. That's when everyone wants to go and trade. And if, you know, centralized exchanges, if the servers are down, you may be losing your money. Again, depending on, you know, what we call the geographic lottery, like depending on where you live, you may have access to some service compared to others. And then let's say you create a new token and you want to somewhere to trade your token, right? You must pay that a centralized exchange because it's an authority to list your token. In comparison, decentralized exchanges are peer to peer. So you're only you're not trading with a centralized exchange. You're trading directly with some other peer. The smart contracts are only used for settlement purposes. You hold custody of your wallets at all times. And also, as long as someone has access to Ethereum, they're, they're able to engage with you, no matter where they live. And I also heard that you created your own token a few lectures ago. So let's say you wanted to list that token on a centralized exchange, right? You'd have to pay a hefty fee. And so listing tokens on centralized exchanges is really limited to you know, who has the capital to do that while decentralized exchanges allow anyone to uh, access these, these exchange services without a sign-up process. So before I go into an overview of some notable DeFi applications, I think we have one or two minutes for questions.
And if I, if there are no questions, I can proceed maybe. I don't know. Uh, I, I once, like, it might be a little too broad, but um, you kind of talked about like interoperability and stuff and like how these different protocols can like fit together like Lego blocks. That is like a fairly significant challenge, right? So like what kind of things do people have to like keep in mind when they're like building their DeFi applications to like what allows them to be able to like plug and play? Like what do they have to like, like ensure their application kind of handles and has if that kind of makes sense like if like because it feels like it can't just like automatically plug and play right yeah so let, let me let me is there try. like a is there like a layer that like like everyone runs is it like i know a lot of DeFi's like run on the ethereum blockchain is that like kind of their like common layer with yeah this kind of thing uh, okay. Yes. Okay. I guess I kind of answered that. But yeah. Yeah. So, so sorry. Uh, sorry if I didn't explain that correctly. So no, no DeFi applications, and I, you know, DeFi actually exists in, you know, it's just in the EOS space, in the uh, Bitcoin space. Uh, I'm I'm going to be specifically speaking about the Ethereum space because that's where my knowledge lies. And okay. on the Ethereum space, right? Many of these, and, and I'm actually going to show some of these applications. All they are is like deployed smart contracts, and cool. Effectively, because smart contracts can be called from other smart contracts, right? You could create uh, okay. the, many smart contracts. They actually have a set of documentation where they publish their interfaces, right? So, mm -hmm. you know, you right. can call this trade function and pass in, you know, a token address and the amount you want to trade, and then the system will like swap them for you, right? So Ooh, you can yeah, effectively yeah. create many different types of combinations of these products put together. Okay, thank you so much. That yeah, no sense. problems. Okay. Daniel, Daniel, I have a question. Um, yes. So, um, what, so like BISC uh, is, a, is a decentralized exchange, right? Um, what, can you speak a little bit to what is the incentive structure that uh, creates uh, an incentive for someone to go around marketing um, a certain market uh, on these exchanges like liquidity has traditionally been an issue with yeah. decentralized exchanges yeah. and so uh that the the reason for that seems to be that centralized ex at least to me naively it seems that centralized exchanges um have this this uh, commission right and and so like there's a lot of skin in the game for someone yeah. to go and do a lot yeah, of absolutely, marketing yeah. so what creates the incentive for someone to go into the marketing and create uh, liquidity uh, on decentralized exchanges. Yeah. So, uh, Dhruv, right? Is that? Yeah, is that's that right. Your name? Yeah. Yeah, Dhruv. Yeah. Yeah. So, Dhruv, that's a really, really good question. I'm actually going to answer it in a couple, in a, in like five to ten slides. Is it okay if I defer your question to that moment and then I can follow up again just to make sure that my slide answered your question? Absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay, cool. So let's go into a, a list of notable DeFi products. I, I've been fairly abstract so far in terms of like what DeFi is and what DeFi can do, but there's been a lot of development recently. So again, let's just look at a couple of categories. The first one is decentralized exchanges. I've mentioned these before. Uh, these exchanges do not necessarily have to have a UI backing them, right? So you may don't you you may not want to compare them to you know, Coinbase or Binance, because most of these, ex you know, decentralized uh, exchanges are just simply a set of smart contracts that are deployed on the blockchain and a documentation page that explains how to use them. And over, over the years, there have been different types of approach for decentralized exchanges, right? We've had uh, automated market makers are one thing that you can search later or there's also, you know, order book based exchanges, but they have a couple things in common, right? First of all, they completely cut out the middleman. So while in centralized exchanges, you have a middleman that basically takes a cut of every trade, decentralized exchanges completely remove the middleman. And so effectively there is a, you know, there is one less person, you know, taking a margin off of your trade. And then they also remove users need to give up custody of their cryptocurrency, just as we said, we mentioned before, right? Users hold the custody of their assets at all times. And another interesting use case in DeFi 
is lending and borrowing. So lenders can learn, earn a little bit of interest for lending their, their assets to a specific product. One example here is compound this, uh, this blue, bluish, sorry, I'm kind of colorblind. I think it's green uh, on the right. Um, you know, you can lend assets to these lending services and earn an interest. And borrowers usually are um, advanced financial traders that are able to loan, borrow an asset and immediately sell it on another exchange, thus, you know, shorting an asset. Or, for example, being able to replicate margin trading by borrowing a specific asset. So usually borrowing is, is used by, by more uh, advanced traders. Then there's stable coins. So stable coins are cryptocurrency that enjoy the many benefits of being a cryptocurrency, you know, such as they're transparent, they're secure, they're private. You can send them across, you know, the globe instantly, but they come without the extreme volatility that comes with other types of digital coins. And there's a reason why, you know, we like being paid in stable currencies such as, you know, the dollar, the euro or the yen. You know, most of these currencies are not, you know, they do, they do have fluctuation. They do, you know, there is a little bit of fluctuation day to day, but most of these currencies are pretty stable, you know, as they're recognized by the United Nations. And so stable coins are able to provide all the benefits of the crypto, but without, you know, that volatility. And that, that's why they're extremely interesting to use. And there are two different types of approaches that have emerged to stable coins. The first one is when the stable coins are pegged at a one-to-one -one ratio with certain fiat currencies, such as the US dollar. An example is this blue currency up here, it's called USDC. And for every USDC, current, for every USDC token out there, there is $1 reserved somewhere else. Other stable coins, such as this one here on the right, this orange D is called DAI. And in these, the DAI is really interesting because it is a little bit less stable, like it does fluctuate a lot more, but it is more decentralized because instead of being pegged to, you know, a reserve in a bank, it's actually pegged to another basket of cryptocurrencies. And I'm not going to go into too much detail of how that works, but there's a lot of really interesting documents on, on how DAI maintains its, its peg to a, to, the, to a stable currency. And then the really, really important actor in the DeFi world is fiat on and off ramps. So these are systems that convert people's fiat funds into cryptocurrency and vice versa. So just think of these services as the ones that uh, you can connect your credit card or your bank account, and they can withdraw $100, you know, $100 and give you $100 worth of Ethereum. And these players are really, really important for adoption because, you know, they're obviously getting people on ramped into the, the Ethereum world and in general into the crypto world. But there's a ton of challenges uh, of, of fiat on and on ramp, on and off ramps, such as legal and KYC. You know, obviously there's a lot of bureaucracy that goes in with the, the crypto space and, you know, all these companies have to comply with that. And so a consequence of, you know, all these like legal and KYC hurdles is that these applications need to have a really, really top solid user experience, right? Because, you know, having users go through a really, really complicated form to hand them cryptocurrency is just going to make them drop off. And so Wire, for example, this app up here, uh, this logo up here is a really great example of a really seamless user experience to onboard users into crypto. And then, I just touched a few use cases. The DeFi space is extremely big and it's really growing. Oh, sorry, missed the slide. There's so many more apps and use cases that I, I just don't have the time to cover. And you know, the scary thing is like, if I was to give this presentation six months down the line, many of these apps would be different or they would have evolved or pivoted, right? The, the DeFi space is really, really new and there's a lot of development that is going on into this space. And because of that, you know, people are really, you know, trying different things and, you know, seeing what works. But one thing for sure is like adoption is growing. On February 14th, we actually had more than $1 billion being 
uh, locked inside of lending uh, lending protocols, which is pretty insane if you think about it. And uh, you know, this just shows that there is adoption; it is growing. And you know, now is a really interesting time to you know to join some of these companies because one thing I know is you know you are all students, so you may be looking for you know internships in the future, or you may be looking for um, you know jobs. And I just want to give you know, my small perspective of what it is working like in this space. So it's extremely challenging, you know, definitely if you want stability, it's not the best place, but uh, because it's such a new space, because that, you know, there's just a lot of opportunity and a lot of, you know, op a lot of things going on, right. You do get to work with some of the smartest people, right. And, you know, the people that I work with are people that are extremely passionate and, you know, love what they do because if they didn't, then there would be no reason to work in DeFi, right? It's just a really small space. And again, you know, if there's one thing which I want to communicate is this space is just going to get bigger. So joining now will give you a really first mover advantage in the in this um, in the space. And another important thing is, you know, if you were to try working in the DeFi space and then you wouldn't like it. Uh, I can guarantee you that like many of the skills that you you would learn in the DeFi space are very, very reusable. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunity from then from you to pivot from crypto to any other field. Um, yeah, it, there's just like a lot of challenges that I think are unique, that are pretty reusable for, for any company. And so, uh, yeah, I'll just take probably two minutes of questions. Uh, before I continue. And uh, Dhruv, your answer is going to be after this next set of slides. Yeah. So uh, yeah, probably one or two questions, if there are any. I've got, uh, I've got, yeah, one or two questions. I just wanted to hear like your view on like one thing. So like, I remember reading about like the whole thing about like Black Thursday and there being problems with like die and stuff. Yeah. And so I kind of wanted to like see from your perspective because I feel like you'd have a cool view on it. Like, so die didn't do like amazing, like it didn't do too hot, right? Like you kind of like, like the value kind of um, fluctuated a little bit. Um, and I know that a lot about die is about like, like um, what's it called, like collateral and stuff. And uh, I just wanted to ask you, like, I've heard that some other platforms did all right. Are there things that like, are there things that like you learned from this that like maybe Dai would learn from this like like things that like like different protocols and like what works in these sort of like ways in terms of like collateral and holding value? Yeah, yeah. So when it comes to the the when it comes to so so, so Dai currently is 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 off the peg. It's it's like uh, one dollar, I think two cents or so. Mm -hmm. So it right. um it's it hasn't returned yet to a dollar, and as you mentioned, there's this kind of like Black Thursday event when the market just went completely crazy. Um, and the answer is like, I don't feel really qualified to answer this question because I don't, I don't, yeah, I, I don't really um, have a ton of context on what that happens. And actually that's one thing which I did want to cover, which is the space is so big and there's so many things happening that it's just really, really, really hard to, you know, stay laser focused on everything. Uh, but uh, Nishan, if you want, to, if you want to contact me after, I will have contacts. And actually, I mean, that would be a fun thing to research together. I, yeah. um, I have a couple of colleagues that are a lot more, um, I have a, someone in my, my company that is a lot more informed on, you know, why, why die is off the peg. And, um, yeah. I, yeah, I was, I, yeah. 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 I was seeing that like, apparently compound did all right, but I like, I have to do my own reading too. So yeah, yeah maybe. and then I have, a, I have a much simpler question. So like, I've heard of like the term KYC and I know what it stands for, but could you explain what exactly that is? Yeah, yeah, um, sure, of course. So KYC stands for know your customer. And the idea is that in the United States, when you, when you are, you know, it, when you have, when you take someone's fiat, money the us dollars and you give them crypto you effectively mm -hmm. need a money transmitting license 
I think that's the right, that's the correct term to use. So there's a specific gotcha. license that these companies need to have. And the, the comp, the, the, the complicates, the, the, the complications lie when you're moving from one world to another, right? There's a lot of forms that, that they, you know, there's a lot of information that a, a money transmitter needs to retain to be compliant, right? Such as, you know, your name and surname and where you live. And I think some of this other information. Got you. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Thanks. So yeah, it's the, the, between the crypto and the non-crypto world, there's a lot of complicated, you know, bureaucracy, yeah. right? Uh, Once you get into the crypto world, it's a lot, you know, it's, it's also a lot, a lot more streamlined, but you know, that passage is it's pretty complicated. Okay, cool. So, okay. So it's about that gateway. Cool. Thanks. Okay, cool. So, hey, um, Daniel, uh, yes? if, if you could, I would also love to join uh, that conversation on why the die is off the tag and yeah. what yeah. they're doing to bring it back. So I, I don't know how open you can make it, but I would love to join as well. Yeah. So here's how we do it. Okay. You send me an email, uh, Nishan sends me an email and we'll open a thread and we'll figure it out. Okay. And my contacts are going to be at the end. Okay. Thank you. Cool. All right. So now let's dig deeper into one specific use case of zero of, of uh, decentralized finance, which is uh, decentralized exchanges, specifically the zero X protocol. And let's start with this really cheesy video, which I've heard uh, maybe a little bit laggy. So we're going to go ahead and play it, but there is a link which was sent in the email for this talk that you can take a look at in case it's too laggy. I have something you want and you have something I want. So we should make a deal. To make a deal, we come to the table. The problem is the table belongs to someone else. So when we sit at their table, a middleman controls the process, holds our valuables, and charges us a lot of money. It's risky, slow, and expensive. What would it look like if this weren't just a table, but a network? A network that no one owns and we can trade directly with each other without anyone in the middle. Enter ZeroX. ZeroX is a decentralized exchange protocol. It's a set of rules that businesses and developers use to create a network of exchange that no one controls. Zero X, anyone can come to the table. This means that if I want to trade my currency for your currency without anyone else, I can do that. Or if I wanted to trade my currency for some real estate, I can do that too. I can trade anything for anything with anyone. See, Zero X isn't just about charts and order books. It's about the exchange of value. Developers can use ZeroX to create marketplaces for the entire world of assets, old and new. They can create markets for game items from your favorite games, or for digital commodities like storage or computing power, even digital art and collectibles. The ZeroX protocol is open source and governed by its users, removing all geographic barriers and opening the door to markets that could never have existed before. It will all be possible thanks to ZeroX. Come to the table. Cool. So I hope it wasn't too laggy. Um, but again, this video is available on YouTube if you want to see it. So what is ZeroX? ZeroX is a decentralized exchange protocol that was launched in 2017 on the Ethereum blockchain. And ZeroX is a protocol and pro protocol means is a set of, it's a, it's a single shared audited set of smart contracts that are deployed on the blockchain. ZeroX supports trading many different types of assets such as ERC-20, ERC-721, and even the more newest ERC-1155. And because it consists of a set of modular smart contracts, if a new asset was to come, come up, we could easily plug it into zero X with zero downtime. 
as of today, we've uh, th these are stats as of September 27th, by the way. We've had a fair amount of volume. We've had a fair amount of transactions. And we've also had more than 30 projects build on top of us, right? So remember when I was talking about composability? Well, these projects are effectively building on top of what we have built, interacting with uh, our smart contracts for, for exchange purposes. And in order to understand 0x more, let's understand the two main actors that make 0x work. So the first person is a maker. So the maker is someone, is a person that has an asset and would like to trade it with, for another asset. So an example here, we have Alice and Alice would like to trade her one Ethereum for 10 wrap tokens. So what she does is she signs a message indicating these trade conditions and she sends it over to Bob. Bob is the taker. The taker is someone who wants a maker's asset. So in this case, Bob has 10 rep tokens and will trade them for that one Ethereum. And so what the taker does is he finds, um, he finds Alice's message and, you know, ag and agrees to that trade. So when Bob it takes Alice's message, he acts as a taker. And when he agrees to perform that trade, he submits, he first he signs that transaction to, and then he submits it on the blockchain to our zero X smart contracts. And assuming that the trade conditions are met, those assets are atomically and trustlessly swapped. And I just want to make sure we, we, uh, we understand what atomically means. So, you know, in Ethereum, there is the sense of atomicity across transactions, right? So we have this, this ledger, right? Containing transactions and within one smart contract interaction, Alice has sent one Ethereum to Bob and Bob sent those 10 rep tokens to Alice, right? So that happened within the context of one single transaction. So that's what I mean by atomic. And what's cool about 0x is if for some reason those trade conditions are not met, the revert happens and no one loses any money. 0x has, uh, and like other decentralized exchanges out there, has a pretty interesting uh, way of, of trading. So there is a off-chain component and a on-chain component. And what I mean by on-chain is anything that reads and writes to the Ethereum blockchain. So we call this approach a off-chain relay and on-chain settlement. And let me explain to you more how this works. So zero X orders are created and signed by the maker entirely off-chain. They are shared to other counterparties also off-chain. Xerox orders are only submitted on-chain by the taker when the settlement occurs, right? So what this means is that because the Xerox orders are completely off-chain compared to some exchanges that have all orders on-chain, it's much cheaper to create orders, right? Because the actual expensive part of the actual expensive part of um, of zero x is the settlement, right? Because you have to effectively send a transaction on chain. That's what's really expensive. So zero x does everything else off chain, thus creating a more and more efficient order book, right? And our bet is that this type of approach, which is you know off chain relay and on chain settlement, will continue to offer the lowest spreads and better prices than other alternative exchanges. Dhruv, I want to answer your question now. When a taker submits an order on the blockchain, so when they fill, when they, when they settle that order, right, on the blockchain, they pay a small fee that goes to the makers. Therefore, incentivizing the makers to provide more liquidity. And what liquidity means here is the ability to buy and sell a specific asset at a competitive price. So makers are incentivized in, in creating liquidity for the system because they do get rewarded through this protocol fee. 
that that makes a ton of sense. So basically, uh, zero x takes the spread of the fees between makers and takers that centralized exchanges have, and then um, codifies that into the protocol, incentivizing the maker. Basically. Yes. So, and and just to mention this, it's actually not a it's not a margin on the trade size, but it's a margin on the gas price that is used. So there's a, there's a little bit of a difference here. And um, I think it's a little bit more complicated to explain why that is, why that's the case now, but let's, let's go through the presentation and then I can follow up once, once I'm, once I'm sure that we're good on the time. Okay. But yes, you know, what you said makes a lot of like, you, I think you've understood it. It's just a margin on a different thing. Okay. okay thank you. Cool. So uh, we mentioned, right, that these orders are created and are signed off chain. And then, the, you know, these takers magically receive these orders. Well, um, you know, because orders have to live off chain, you know, they, they, where, where do they live, right? They live in Xerox Mesh. And um, Xerox Mesh is an off chain decentralized peer to peer network, apologies for the buzzwords, uh, for relaying orders. So. The best way to think about this is if you've ever used BitTorrent in the past, right, to download Ubuntu images, nothing else, um, you will have used uh, something similar to what Xerox Mesh is. Xerox Mesh is a peer to peer network like BitTorrent, but it's only for Xerox orders, right? And so, what the way it works is that makers submit their orders into Mesh, right? They send their orders into Mesh. And then Mesh facilitates the discovery of those orders by broadcasting them to every node in the network. And then the takers can simply pull and query Mesh for orders. And when they receive an order that they want to settle on chain, they'll just go and, and you know, send the transaction to the Xerox exchange. And I won't go into too much detail about Mesh, but there's a ton of amazing content about it on YouTube. So, yeah, it's it's pretty exciting, pretty exciting uh, service. So, I want to talk about zero x orders. So, we we've, we've talked about these. Um, I'm just going to go back. Oh, sorry, here. So, again, makers create these orders, right? And they sign them, and then they send them to the takers, right, through zero x mesh. And what do these orders actually look like? Well, first of all, a Xerox order is nothing else but a JSON object, right? It just consists in, in a, a few parameters. And these parameters effectively indicate the maker's intent to get into a trade, right? So this effectively is a, is a order. If you've ever, if you've ever if you've used a other exchange like Coinbase or Binance, this is effectively, this effectively becomes or a bid or an ask. So I just wanna go through some of these parameters on the order. The first ones are the maker address and the taker address. The maker address is the, is the address that created an order. So before, if you remember the slides where we had Alice and Bob, the maker address here is Alice. The taker address is the address that is allowed to fill the order. This is usually set to zero, which means that any address is allowed to fill the order. The, many times you'd wanna set the taker address to a specific address if you're doing like an OTC trade. An OTC um, is, is basically when you're agreeing up front to a specific trade. And that's a situation where you wanna set the taker address to someone that you know. But most of the times, the taker address is simply a uh, is, is set to zero. That means anyone can fill the order. And as I mentioned before, an order is not valid unless it is signed by the maker. So let's talk about maker asset data and taker asset data. So these are a little bit more complicated. They require a little bit more attention and also I'm going to simplify this explanation for the purpose of this tutorial. So first of all, the maker asset data and the taker asset data are fields of an order that explain, that, that, that tell 0x what assets are being traded, 
right? So they, they contain information specific to the assets that we want to trade. As you can see, this part here outlined in orange, these, these first four bytes reference what type of token the maker or taker is exchanging. In this case, this F47261B0, I've seen it so many times, I just pattern match it now, uh, means ERC20, right? So what this means is that this order is selling one ERC20 token for another because they both have the same prefix. The remaining 32 bytes of data instead reference the address of the ERC20 token that we want to trade, right? Padded with a ton of zeros. So this specific maker asset data and taker asset data means that this user is selling some amount of DAI for Ethereum, right? So the maker asset data is DAI, so the user is selling DAI. And the user is wants to sell DAI for WEATH. Oh, and apologies, uh, WEATH is just Ethereum. Yeah. And then we have maker asset, uh, sorry, maker asset amount and taker asset amount, which are the amount of maker asset and taker asset that are being offered by the maker or taker. So these must be greater than zero. And bear in mind that you see like a ton of zeros here because these amounts are represented as base unit amounts. As you know, I know you've covered ERC20 before. Most tokens need to, in Ethereum, you need to store uh, numbers. They can only be stored as big integers, right? And so the number of, every, every token has a separate number of decimals that, that they, you know, they retain for, for, for precision, right? They specify for precision. So in this case, both DAI and Ethereum have 18 decimals. So if you were to do the math here, the maker is willing to trade 200 DAI for one Ethereum, specifically in this case. And then finally, I wanna talk about expiration time seconds. So this is a Unix epoch that describes when the order will expire. So in this case, this specific order will expire in November 19th, 2020. And so up until that moment, this order will be fillable. It will be, you can, you can, set, you can set it, settle it on the blockchain. But after that moment, the exchange will simply revert because this order has deemed expired. Okay, so before we talk about the Xerox API, I have uh, three minutes for questions in case someone has a question. Yeah, I had a question. Um, so like for the Xerox protocol, so you said the orders are relayed off chain, right? Yes. So like the nodes that do that, I know it's probably early days, but right now, like how many nodes do you have and like how active are they? Yeah, good question. I don't have a, I mean, I, I know where to look for those numbers. I just don't know at the top of my head. But um, from my understanding, actually, I don't want to say anything. I don't want to say rubbish. Um, I can follow up with those numbers if you want. Okay, yeah, sure. And those numbers are public information. Okay, right? yeah, I'll, I'll look it up. Yeah, yeah, nice. yeah I, I'm sorry. I actually don't, don't know those numbers because I don't work on, on, on Mesh, but... Um, I know that they have, as part of their, their objectives, they, they have a certain number of nodes that they want uh, not, not owned by them, you know, like not owned by the Xerox team. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Any and, question um, about, uh, yes, sir? Where, where does the atomicity across chains come from? Is that, is that mostly like multi-sig across chains? Or yeah, how do you how do you make something atomic across in that example, Dai and Weath, for example? So these are not across different chains. So Dai and Weath are two ERC twenty tokens, right? So okay, oh, right, okay. Let, let me let me let me try and explain this a little bit better. So Dai and Weath, right, are two um, cryptocurrencies that are represented as smart contracts on the Ethereum blockchain, right? So these two addresses here, right? This 6B175 is DAI's address and 
C02AA is, is Ethereum's address. And these tokens, so the, these smart contracts contain inside this inside the smart contract, they contain a lookup table, right? Which effectively says, you know, this this address has this number of you know DAI tokens, or you know, this address has this number of ether tokens. And so because DAI exists on the is deployed on the Ethereum blockchain, and because Ether is deployed on the Ethereum blockchain, it's because 0x is also deployed on the Ethereum blockchain. They're all on the same blockchain. With one transaction, Ethereum, sorry, with, with one transaction, the 0x protocol can, you know, withdraw DAI from the maker and give it to the taker, and then withdraw the Ethereum from the taker and give it to the maker, right? all within that same transaction. So it doesn't happen across the, it's not across different blockchains. It's always the same blockchain here. That's the only way you can retain atomicity. Okay, that makes sense. So you would only be able to trade assets that are collateralized by Ethereum. And so the, the proof of transfer experiment is different. Like people trying to do DeFi off of Bitcoin, that, that's, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, that's a whole different thing. Yeah, sorry if, if it wasn't too clear, but yes, that's a, that's, a, that's a completely separate thing. This is all related to Ethereum, right? And what we've seen is we've seen, use, we've seen um, people create different types of ERC-20 tokens of other cryptocurrencies out there. So for example, there is a TBTC, I think, which is a... Um, which is a ERC-20 token that represents, that is pegged to Bitcoin. I'm not sure how that happens, but usually if you want to do- They just do like proof of burn or something where they just burn I some Bitcoin think so. and collateralize it. I think it. so, yes, yes. And I think there's a lot of papers on that. So there's a lot of stuff to read. But usually when people want to trade, you know, different type of cryptocurrencies of different types of, of separate blockchains, uh, you will usually kind of like, create an ERC-20 token and peg it to that, to that currency. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, hi, I, I have a question not related to the protocol, but sure. um, so I, I know some centralized exchanges such as Binance, who already has a huge user base, are also trying to develop their uh, decentralized exchanges. Do you think that will be a big challenge for 0x? Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, so, so Binance is developing their Binance DEX or Binance Decentralized Exchange. They obviously have a really huge user base, right? Because they're Binance. Um, and right. the, the, the idea here is like, you know, definitely 0x is a decentralized exchange such as Binance. But at this point in time, I don't think like there is too much competition. I think there is more collaboration into wanting to build, build this DeFi ecosystem together, right? The space is so small now that I think if, if any of the sides, if, if any exchange or any DeFi product grows, it will make the entire ecosystem grows. So, you know, there definitely is competition and I don't know exactly, you know, what Binance uh, Dex is doing now. But I'm actually pretty excited because, you know, if they can get more people onboarded into, you know, trustless wallets, you know, non-custodial wallets and, um, you know, so if, if they can get more people onboarded onto, you know, this decentralized finance world, I think it's just going to benefit the entire ecosystem. Gotcha. Gotcha. Thanks. Okay, cool. So I think we have one more minute. If someone has a question, if not, we can go into Xerox API. Uh, yeah, I do have a question. Hi. Um, Hi. So how does the user interface look like right now for the product in terms of just thinking about the user side, so for the maker or for the taker? And so in other words, how tech savvy do you want your users right now to interact with the protocol? Yeah, yeah. So when you talk about user interface, I just want to make sure, well, I want to emphasize one thing. It's really hard to compare zero X with, you know, Binance or Coinbase Pro that have user interface because zero X is just a set of smart contracts, right? 
So you can think of zero X as simply being a set of smart contracts with a, with some documentation, right? Other teams create user interfaces on top of zero X and on top of other products. So what, what you would think as a, as a product, right? That you can actually, you know, go on a web page and trade or like a, a mobile app, those, um, you know, we defer, we defer building, you know, the development of products. We are deferring that to, you know, a lot of other teams out there that build on top of us. Um, so I, that's one question that I wanted to answer. And then just to follow up, like what the user experience looks like on those, on those, um, on those products, I think it looks pretty good, you know, like, there are like a little bit of quirks, but if you go to Radar Relay, which is a, is a really good um, Xerox based exchange. So uh, search for Radar Relay okay. and you should be able to use that to create orders or to uh, swap tokens if you wanted to. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Can you give yeah. some other examples about um, um, some other uh, products implementing your protocol? Um, yes, yes. I. Really, that's a really good question. So, so there's this really cool company which is called Microsponsors. And uh, what Microsponsors is doing is it's creating tokens for people's time. So for example, so I, I, I am fundraising for, I'm fundraising for a bike ride that I will be doing. Unfortunately, it got canceled, but I'm still fundraising because obviously the funds go to charity. Yeah. to um i'm fundraising for this bike ride and i'm using this company called micro micro sponsors to mint specific tokens that can be um can be used in my web page as as a, like a specific like like kind of like an ad right so you can sponsor like one day of my journey by 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 you know taking that order and trading it for you know ethereum or die or some other currency effectively giving me sponsor money to do, you know, what I need to do for charity. That's one example. Another example is collectibles. So game items, right? There's, there's this video game called Gods Unchained, which is a, um, I think it's a web application and they have an entire collect collectible marketplace, right? That you can use to like buy and sell specific items in the game. And that is using zero X. So they're using zero X to effectively buy and sell those, those collectible items. Yeah. That's and yes. Yeah. I was just saying re if that's really interesting to see how yeah. people are using the protocol. Yeah. yeah. And, and this is what's the cool thing about the protocol is like, you know, there are so many different types of, of, you know, if you think of value, right? Like I think the whole idea around this decentralized finance is, there's so many more abstract levels of value that don't necessarily, you know, work in the, you can't really, you know, use in this, in the traditional finance, finance world. So in the DeFi space, you know, you can tokenize those things and you can create a market out of them. So that's pretty interesting things. Um, there's also another cool, this is not specific to Xerox, it's specific to just ERC20 tokens in general. There's this designer called that boy that created a, uh, created a token called boy and one boy token is equals to one hour of design work for him. So you could effectively like buy his, his, his token and then you could redeem it for his work or you could like sell it to someone else. Right. And you know, that's what I think of as tokenized labor. By the way, I was looking at the chat window. I'm really, it's great to see like activity and, you know, people asking questions and people answering them. That's pretty, very nice to see. Cool. Okay. So let's now let's, let's, let's get more practical. Okay. So we've talked about, you know, why DeFi, some examples of DeFi products talked about what zero X is as a DeFi product. And we've also went into like some technical aspects of zero X, such as the order type, and um, you know some of the syntax around the, the schema. So let's actually, th this part here is gonna be a lot more practical. It's going to, we're gonna actually dig into 
how to consume liquidity from Xerox, how to swap tokens, right? And when I mean by consume liquidity, it means basically how do I trade one token for another, right? So first of all, we've been, we've been iterating over zero X quite a bit. And in order to understand some of our pain points, let's look at this, uh, this represent this graph representation over here, this, this loop, right? So this is our, you know, this is our, our liquidity, our liquidity pool, right? Our liquidity loop. We have makers that create orders, right? To buy and sell an asset and they send them into mesh. And then takers read from mesh, pull mesh for a specific order type. And then when they find an order that they want to settle on chain, they, they uh, broadcast that order on chain and they pay a small protocol fee, right? Which then goes back to the makers, right? So you create this pretty nice loop. But, you know, as, as, much, as, as much as we've really tried to, you know, improve this process, there still is a huge steep, you know, there's a pretty steep learning curve. Like even like talking about these things today with you or making this presentation made me realize that there's still like so much work that needs to be done to like simplify the entire DeFi space, which is, you know, has, has a certain barrier of entry. Also, more technically speaking, 0x mesh requires teams to host, you know, a backend service, right? This is like, 0x mesh is like a Postgres or Redis, right? It's like a backend server that you have to host. And so, you know, that may, that may be expensive. And what we found out is like developers will prefer to implement, will prefer to choose protocols with a worse pricing in order to have a simpler developer experience, right? So even if Xerox may be the best price for a specific market, they will choose to integrate another exchange because it's simpler. And so what we've ended up, what, what, we've, what we've ended up doing is we've built this product called the Xerox API. And the Xerox API is a REST API, right? So the speaks HTTP, which should be known by most of the developers out there, right, is a, is, a, is a HTTP API that you can use to access liquidity on the 0x mesh network, right? You can host your own 0x API. It's, it's fully open source, or you can just use our hosted endpoint. And the idea behind 0x API is you can request, you basically uh, ping, ping the 0x API requesting a quote right? And then Xerox API will ping the mesh node to get the best orders for that quote. Most importantly, the Xerox API won't just return a list of orders that will fill that quote, but it'll also construct a Ethereum transaction on your behalf. And what this means is as a Ethereum develop as, as a, as a um, front-end Ethereum developer, I need to know little to no knowledge about zero X because as long as I can call the zero X API request a quote and then fill the, and, and then uh, take that Ethereum transaction and send it on chain, I'm able to access liquidity from zero X. But we zero X API does a little bit more than that. It actually, aggregates liquidity from other decentralized exchanges, right? Remember when we talked about composability and interoperability? Well, Xerox API effectively just does, does that too, right? So when you request a quote to sell one asset for another, let's say you're saying, um, let's say you want to sell 1500 DAI for Ethereum. The Xerox API will sample, will not only sample Xerox mesh, right? Which is what we call native liquidity, or off-chain order book liquidity, it'll also sample pricing from all these other decentralized exchanges. So Kyber and Uniswap and Oasis are other decentralized exchanges. And so it'll sample liquidity from, from these other exchanges and it'll return a quote, which is representative of all this pricing put together. And sometimes the best price for performing a swap, a, a trade, is going to be a, a mixing, uh, mixing all these specific 
sources of liquidity together, right? Most importantly for the developer, there is no change in, in how you interact. If it's one source of liquidity or a hundred sources of liquidity, for the developer, they receive a quote from the Xerox API and they can just simply use that Ethereum transaction that has already been made for them and send it on and send it onto the chain. And then Xerox will do the rest. And this is what allows us to change our liquidity funnel um, to this. So makers still send their orders into mesh, right? That hasn't changed. But now between Mesh and the takers, there's also Xerox API. So, and Xerox API reads not only native liquidity from Mesh, it also reads pricing from other decentralized exchanges. And takers can then get the Ethereum transaction that the Xerox API has created for them and can fill it on chain. And, um, now we can go into the workshop, which will take uh, around 30 minutes or so. So I just wanted to double check. Is there maybe one question? There's time for one question or so. Cool. Okay, so I'm just gonna share my screen here a second. I've already set up the workshop. Oh, and by the way, I'm all ears in the meantime, if, if you had anything for me. And also, uh, while Daniel is walking us through the workshop, feel free to ask any question about like the code or any technical aspects, because it will be important for you to understand it uh, to do the homework. Daniel, I have one sort of small question. Sure. Like, are like volatile exchange rates ever like a consideration for like in zero X? Like, has it ever been like a problem? Yeah. Like, about, like, like I feel like it could like I don't know yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we, 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 see, we see a ton of volume when, when exchange rates are, are more volatile, right? And the reason why that's the case is because our, our market makers, so market makers are, um, you know, th those makers that are creating, you know, orders to buy and sell, right? But they do it professionally, right? right? So they're trying to basically make money off, off of the trading. And um, as of today, what we've, what we've noticed is that uh, these volatile exchange rates do cause market makers to increase the, those, those margins, right? So let's say like okay. Dai, let's make it really simple. Dai is trading is, is usually trading at a dollar, right? And the markets are going mm -hmm. crazy, right? On you know Black Thursday or whatever, whatever you know, whatever right. bad day you know, whatever good or bad day we have on the markets. Well, mm -hmm. traders basically don't want to expose themselves too much. So what that'll do is it'll instead of instead of you know buying dye for 99 cents and selling dye for one dollar and one cent right they'll buy yeah. for you know instead of instead of applying that that you know one one cent margin they'll apply higher margins and so that does create um you know a, a worse pricing right got you All right. yeah and this happens this happens less on other types of exchanges that you know we can cover mm -hmm. later such as amms which instead happen, you know, the, the price changes because of arbitrage, basically. Got you. Thanks. Yeah, I was thinking like this is like a place for arbitrage to like take place, right? With the whole thing about like even how like the zero X API might choose like like a mixture of exchanges for the best price and stuff. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. All right. Yeah. We don't need to get too into it though. Yeah. 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 Cool. And I'm I'm I'd love to you know I just want to uh, I want to make sure that we we go for the workshop, but. You know, yeah, I'm really yeah. passionate about this stuff. So, you know, if you want to chat after, it's a lot of really cool things that we can talk about. Right. Thank you. Cool. So, first of all, do you all see my screen? Can you read the text? Can everyone see the text? Is it too small or? It's good. Okay. Is it good now? Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. And you can also see this window here to the left, right? Mm -hmm. Perfect. Okay, cool. So as part of this workshop today, we're going to build a uh, decentralized exchange user interface for swapping DAI with USDC, right? To sell DAI for USDC or to sell USDC for DAI. 
And uh, just to make it a little bit more realistic, let's say like, you know, you're a developer that is trying to break into the DeFi space and you actually have been looking at pricing lately and you found out that the Xerox API does offer the best price for DAI and USDC. And so what you want to do is you want to build your own branded user interface to simply swap between the two tokens. As part of this tutorial, we're going to be learning a couple of things. So first of all, we'll learn how to set up your web page with Ethereum using a web free provider. And I know many of you have already done this, so I'm just going to go through it pretty quickly. But then we're going to cover some pretty important practical aspects of interacting with ERC20 tokens. So what we're going to cover, first of all, is something called a contract wrapper. And a contract wrapper is simply a JavaScript class uh, around an ERC20 token, uh, effectively removing the friction of, of having to, you know, perform ABI encoding or serialization or deserialization to talk to a specific smart contract, right? So a ERC20 token wrapper is simply a JavaScript class which implements all the ERC20 functions and makes, makes interacting with an ERC20 token look like you're interacting with some other, uh, you know, just a plain JavaScript object. Then we're going to be covering handling decimals in tokens. So we, we've already talked about this before, you know, tokens may have different types of decimals and so we have to perform conversion there. Then we're going to be setting allowances. I remember allowances are what allow uh, the zero X smart contract to withdraw from your wallet a predetermined amount of tokens for the swap. And then finally, we'll integrate with a Xerox API. Most importantly, we're operating on the Kovan blockchain, right, which is a testnet. And because we're on a testnet, these are obviously not DAI or USDC, but they are drop-in replacements that I created for the purpose of this tutorial, right? They are effectively a pure replacement but they offer one small extra functionality, which is I can press this button and just create new tokens. I can, I can set my own balance of that token, right? And obviously these tokens are just for set, for, for testing purpose, right? So this is what I call a mintable token. I'm also just using a new address. This is an Ethereum address that I just created, okay? I just funded it with, with some Ethereum to, uh, for the purpose of this demo, but no other transaction has been, has been done on this address. And so just to make sure that things work, I'm just gonna start by minting some DAI. Okay, so I press this button and my MetaMask pops up. It's gonna confirm it. This may take a little bit of time, so we're just gonna do this while we go through the tutorial. So, most of our code is going to be in the end, in the exercise.ts file that, that you have in the repository. But before we do that, I just want to cover web free provider engine. So web free provider engine is a class that comes from the zero X sub providers module, the zero X sub providers package and the zero and, um, and the web free provider engine is what allows you to connect to, to the Ethereum network, right? And so you've already done providers, but the difference between uh, the web free provider that you have used and this provider engine is this provider engine allows you to, allows you to add multiple sub providers in a way in which it acts like middleware, right? So an example here is we have this provider engine and we've added two sub providers here. We've added a MetaMask sub provider which is responsible for signing transactions, right? Because we were basically delegating to MetaMask the signing of, of transactions. And then we are using an Inf Infura is just a, um, you can sign up for Infura. It's, it's, a, um, it's a very famous service to access Ethereum. We're going to be used Infura to read and write from the blockchain. Right, so anything else that isn't a sign request will go through Infura. And so across this tutorial, we're going to, you're going to see, you're going, we're going to implement functions that take this 
Web3 provider engine as parameters, just think of when you see that, that function with that parameter, just think of this argument being passed in, okay? The second thing I wanna cover are uh, these token wrappers, right? So we're going to be working with this class called ERC20 token contract. So this is a token wrapper. This is a wrapper around the ERC20 token interface. So how does that work? It's a class that you can initialize and it takes two arguments. The first one is that uh, the, the token address, so the, the address of the ERC20 token that is deployed on the blockchain. And then the second argument is our web free provider. We're going to learn how to read and write values from the blockchain. When you read a value from the blockchain, that does not require a transaction. And the way you do that is you, you, you create, you, once you created your contract instance, you call the function of the ERC20 token method, right? In this case, name is a, is a, is a method on the ERC20 token. And then you use call a sync and call a sync returns a promise that you can await. Await basically means that you're going to wait till that promise to, to resolve, right? And this await will return your, your value, which is going to be a, a string here, right? And these token wrappers automatically, depending on the type of function that you're calling, will return different types of, uh, different types, right? So name is gonna be a string, but decimals will be a big number, right? because it's, it's obviously a number of decimals. Writing values on the blockchain is a little bit more complicated in terms of this first leg is, this first leg here is exactly the same as above, right? So you call the function, you call the method on the ERC20 token, right? So in this case, transfer, which takes these two arguments. But then instead of using call async, you, 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 you use await transaction success async. And you pass in an object which uses the address, right? So in this case, this 0x my address is going to be replaced by our MetaMask address. And again, you're always awaiting here. Once you call this, what this will do is it'll pop up MetaMask, right? So on my user interface, MetaMask will come up and it'll say, do you agree to sign this transaction? Because again, because we're writing a value on the blockchain. And the first function we're actually gonna go and implement is going to uh, involve using token wrappers to convert numbers from unit amount to base unit amount. And uh, just to remember, unit amount is a humanly readable number, right? Like uh, 133.232, it contains you know, decimals. And again, Ethereum can only store integer values. So in order to display a number on the UI, which contains decimals, which is humanly readable, you need to get the, you know, that big integer, right? That is stored on Ethereum. And then the number, also the number of decimals places that you have, right? And this is an example of what we're expecting the function to return, right? So USDC has six decimals. Right? So if we call this function convert value from human to Ethereum with USDC as first argument and number five as second argument, it's going to return this five with, with, um, with six zeros, right? This other example is with DAI. DAI has 18 decimals. And so if I pass in DAI and then I pass in 20.5, it'll return a number with 18 decimals, with, with, with 18, you know, with it padded, padded with, in this case, 17 zero, because there's a dot five here. So let's go ahead and implement this, this function for now. So the first thing we wanna do is we wanna get the decimals, right, from, from the contract. So we go token wrapper. As you can see here, the autocomplete should work pretty well. So I'm gonna call the function dot decimals which is a, um, a method on the, on the ERC20 token. And I'm gonna use call a sync, right? So now this decimals should return a big number, right? And a big number is just like a big integer. And then I'm gonna use this function, which 0x provides. It's a static function, which is called two base unit amount. 
And this function accepts two arguments. The first one is the amount, that the humanly readable number here, which is going to be unit amount. And then the second argument is going to be the number of decimals here. So I'm going to pass in decimals. And I also have to convert this to number. There you go. OK, cool. So this should be enough to, to implement this function. OK. As you can see, as I save the function, uh, my, my code reloads. Also, you may see here that my balance for die is now increased because remember, I, I performed that minting, right? So now, part the, the meat of this workshop is going to be implementing this selling functionality that we have here, right? So we have two buttons here. One is selling USDC for die, and the other button is selling die for USDC. Both these buttons are hooked up to the same callback. Right, so when I click this button here, right, the sell token is going to be USDC and the buy token is going to be DAI. And when I click this other button here, the sell token is going to be DAI and the buy token is going to be USDC. Again, yeah, these are both hooked up to the same function. So by implementing this function, we should get both sides of the swap. And so as part of this workshop, we're going to implement this as the meat of this workshop, we're going to go and implement this function. And I just want to outline the various steps that we're going to do, right? We're going to provide the best user experience possible. So we're going to handle a few things for the user. The first thing we want to do is this function is going to be triggered when someone wants to perform the swap. So the first thing we want to do is we want to check, does the user have enough balance? And then, if the user doesn't have enough balance, we can just bail out by like, you know, raising an error or something. Once, once the user has enough balance to perform the swap, we need to make sure that the, that the, the zero X exchange has an allowance, right? Remember we have to make sure that the allowance is set, that the zero X exchange can withdraw funds from our wallet. And if not, we're going to have to set that allowance. And then finally, we're going to make a request to the zero X API. And then we're going to inspect the data coming back from the zero X API. And then finally, we're going to fill that order and perform the swap effectively completing the exchange. So let's start from the beginning. Okay. So we have to check, does the user have enough balance to perform the swap? So, we have this parameter here, which is the amount to sell that the, uh, the function passes us. So this is always a hundred, right? Cause we're always selling a fixed amount here, which is a hundred, right? But this is passed in, in, in a humanly readable number, right? So what we want to do is we want to convert this humanly readable number to a, uh, machine readable number, right? So I'm going to call this, I'm going to use the syntax. I'm going to say amount to sell in Ethereum to mean what, when it's to, to mean that this variable holds a big integer. Okay. So, uh, I guess a quick poll here. Can anyone think of a function that we can use to transform a humanly readable number into an Ethereum number question? One, two, All right, well, I'll tell you, it's uh, convert value from human to Ethereum. It's this function here. So I can use this function that we just built here, this convert value from human to Ethereum can be used here. We just built it. And the first argument that we're going to pass is the token wrapper, right? In this case, we want, because we're converting the sell amount, we want to use the sell token wrapper. And then the second argument that we're going to be using here is the unit amount. In this case, it's this amount to sell unit amount. Okay, and now just to make sure that this is working, okay, I'm going to use alert here to, to show, just to make sure that we're on, this, on, the, on the right page, okay? We're gonna use an alert. And so what I'm expecting here is to have if I, if I'm go, if I'm selling die, I want to see the amount that I'm selling, which is a hundred, with eighteen zeros. 
Okay, so let's try that. Perfect. So it read, it read the number of decimals from the blockchain. It performed the conversion for us. In this case, DAI has 18 zeros. So this is 100 plus 18 zeros. And now let's look at USDC instead. USDC only has six zeros because it just has a different number of decimals for, for other reasons. So we're on the right page, okay? We're, we're, we're going, we're doing well, okay? So now that we have a number that we can compare, right? We can get the user's balance. We can use the balance of function, right? On the contract and the balance of function accepts our own address here, which is conveniently passed in as from address. We can read the value. Okay. And now we can say if, if the, if our balance in Ethereum is less than the amount to sell in Ethereum. Okay. Uh, we can send an alert saying insufficient balance. Okay. And return. Cool. So let's just reload this. Okay, perfectly. So that worked. So now what we're going to do, okay, is I'm going to, I'm going to try and sell, I'm going to press this sell hundred die for, for USDC and it shouldn't return anything because the balance is sufficient. Okay. So that works. Now I'm going to try and sell hundred USDC for die, right? And so here the sell token and sell amount, the sell token is going to be USDC. And this should trigger this alert clause because we have no balance of USDC. Perfect. Cool. All right. So we've handled that situation. So now from line, from line 83 onwards, we should, we should be able to assume that the user has enough money to perform this, this transaction. But we cannot assume that this person has enough allowance to perform the swap. So what we're going to do is we're going to load the allowance, right? And the allowance is, is a big integer, just like the balance, right? But when we get the allowance, I'll show you now. We pass in two arguments instead of one. The first one is the owner, which is the same one as above. But the second one is the spender. And the spender here is a bit particular because we're using in zero X, right? If you're trading ERC 20 tokens, you have to set an allowance to the ERC 20 proxy. If you're trading ERC 721 tokens, you have to set an allowance on the ERC 721 proxy. Every token type that is supported by zero X has its own proxy and you have, and providing allowance to this proxy is what allows you to trade with zero X. So in this case, I have this object that I already created here, which is simply a, um, a JSON object that contains a mapping between a deployed contract name and its address on the Kovan blockchain, right? So these are all contract addresses. And so I can use 0x deployed addresses dot ERC20 proxy. So this is going to give me the allowance of the ERC20 proxy. Okay, so now that we've fetched that allowance, oh, sorry, and I, and I have to use call a sync here. And now we're gonna say, if, if our allowance in Ethereum is less than the amount to sell, now we don't, we're not gonna bail out, right? Because we just have to set that allowance. So this is the first time we've been reading from the blockchain up until now. Now we're going to be writing to the blockchain. How are we going to do that? We're going to use sell token wrapper dot. The, met, the method that we're going to use is called approve. Approve is the method that, is the, is the method that uh, allows, approves a specific spender to spend a maximum amount of value from, from the sender itself. So, Approve accepts two arguments. The first one is the spender, 
Okay, we already know the spender here. It's our ERC20 proxy. And then we're going to have, and then we're going, we, we need a second argument here, which is the amount. And I'm just gonna set an arbitrary amount here. Uh, allowance in human. So I wanna, I'm just gonna set a number, which is 300 in this case. So we're going to approve the RC20 proxy for 300 tokens. So again, this is the allowance in human number. We have to convert it uh, in Ethereum, right? Using the same, um, using our function convert value from human to Ethereum. We're gonna pass in that cell token wrapper, and then we're gonna pass in that allowance. Cool. And now we're gonna pass in that allowance in Ethereum. Ethereum parameter. And now we're not going to be calling call us, we're not going to be using call a sync, but we're going to use await transaction success async. And we're going to pass in our own address. Cool. And so now, just like we did before, I'm just going to alert here at the end of the flow. It's going to do JSON string. I'm just going to alert a JSON blog, JSON blob, which contains our allowance and our balance. Cool. Oh, this is wrong. Perfect. Okay, so now what I'm going to expect here is I'm going to press this sell 100 die for USDC. It's going to pass the balance check because we have we have enough we have enough balance. But it's not going to pass the allowance check, right? Because we we don't have an allowance. I've I've just created this this live live value here which corresponds to the amount of allowance that we've currently set on die. There's no allowance, so it'll pass inside this this if statement. It'll pass inside this if, if statement and we we will be prompted by MetaMask to set an allowance for 300 tokens. So, for that. Okay, so our MetaMask window popped up. And as you can see, MetaMask has actually already, um, has parsed the, the data that we're sending as it recognized that we're actually calling the approve function. So it actually provides this custom dialogue saying, do you allow this web page, which is localhost, to spend your die, and you can even like edit the permission, saying, uh, you know, this basically is saying the application has proposed that you set an allowance of three hundred, but you can even set a custom amount. It's just trying to be nice, but effectively, what this just tells me is that we're on the right page. So I'm going to confirm this, okay? And now, if everything goes well, my the number here, the allowance is going to change to three hundred. Okay. Yes, perfect. So that allowance has now been set. So what that means is if I press this if I press this button again, it's actually not going to trigger this 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 approval process again, right? Because we have enough we have enough uh, allowance. So I'm just going to try that again. Perfect. So again, this is the allowance that we've currently set in the in you know in Ethereum and our balance is um you know, our balance is actually uh, dif different. Yeah, oh, oh, there it is. Okay, sorry, it got trimmed by the, by the end line, yes. Our balance is actually 1,000 tokens, right? If you're able to do the math there. So now we've set our allowance. We're going to go into the third step of our, um, of our tutorial, which is actually performing the swap of tokens, right? So we have the money to perform the swap, We've had, we set the allowance, we're all good to go. We just need to make that request to the API. And so I've actually already written some code here that we can just uncomment. Um, and what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually look at the 0x API docs. Okay, 
So we need to interact with the Xerox API. We need to request a, a REST API request to the swap endpoint, right? So the swap endpoint allows us to easily get a quote, right? As you can see here, you this is this is the uh, URL to connect to our own uh, hosted Xerox API, the quote endpoint. In my case, I've just prefixed the URL with Kovan, so that we Kovan is the name of the testnet, so it's actually using the Kovan deployed testnet. As you can see, there are various parameters that we can pass in to the to this uh, quote endpoint. The two parameters that are mandatory are buy token and sell token. These can be or names of the tokens, or they can be the address of the token. For simplicity now, we're just gonna pass in the addresses here. We can start by doing that. So sell token is going to be sell token wrapper dot address, and buy token is going to be buy token wrapper dot address. Okay, cool. And then here it mentions buy amount. Uh, but we can even provide sell amount. So, or you provide the buy amount or you provide the sell amount. In our case, we're going to provide the sell amount and we know exactly how much we want to sell. It's going to be amount to sell in Ethereum. Perfect. And then finally, there's a final parameter which isn't described here and is an optional parameter. It's called taker address. And what taker address allows the Xerox API to do is it allows your XAPI to create a better transaction, which is less prone to errors. So we're going to provide the taker address here, which is simply our own address, right? So from address. Oh, and this needs to be a string. Okay, perfect. Cool. So now this this, uh, so here on, on line 108, we're gonna perform that HTTP request and we're gonna get back the response. And the response is gonna look like this, right? So we're gonna have the price of the swap, the guaranteed price. So this is accounts for something called slippage, which I can talk about after. But then if you've used Ethereum, these fields may be pretty familiar to you. You have two and then you have data and value and gas and gas price. And um, what these fields are, they are the standard Ethereum transaction data, uh, transaction format. And so what we're going to do is we're going to get this JSON response and we're going to pull out these transaction fields from there so we can actually expect, you know, inspect what, what that transaction looked like. So I'm going to start by saying from is equals to based on response from, it's gonna be pretty much just pulling out those fields. JSON response here is just this object, okay? Perfect. Okay, so it looks like we've got that coded up. So just to recap, okay, what do we have here? Okay, first we're gonna check, you know, does the user have enough money to perform the swap? Then we're going to set allowances if the user doesn't have the allowances. And then we're gonna make a request to the API. And we're just, for now, we're just going to inspect the, res the response, right? So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna open my, because we're using a console.log, I'm just gonna open my, my terminal here, okay? Uh, and I'm also gonna make this bigger because if not, you won't be able to see anything, okay? And so now if stuff works, because stuff has to work, let's try to sell 100 die for USDC. And it looks like the response was successful, okay? So again, we sent a actual HTTP request here. Um, oops, sorry. Okay, I, I can show you after. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we sent an actual HTTP request to the API 
and this API returned successfully with a quote, right? And we have just extracted this Ethereum transaction data, right? From, from that response. So this is all you need to fill the order. This is all you need to swap the tokens, the trade. And then there's an optional field. So th there's an extra field inside the response, which is called orders. And if you're curious to know, like, what exactly am I doing when I'm sending this transaction, you know, when I'm sending this transaction into the, on, onto the blockchain, what I'm, what you're actually doing is you're, you're, you're filling these orders, right? So this is, this orders is an array of, of orders. This is the syntax that we saw before, right? This is a zero X order. And as you can see, what this is saying is that you're going to be filling this order or these, these multiple orders to, to uh, perform that swap. In our case, there is just one order available. And uh, just to let you know, this is actually me. So, you know, obviously you'd be asking yourself, who's providing liquidity for this like dummy pair, right? I'm actually running like a small bot, which is like, you know, providing, you know, orders to buy and sell this token just for the purpose of this demo. And so if you were to broadcast these values on chain, right, which is what we're going to do now, if we're going to, if you were to send a transaction, if you were to send this transaction, it would fill this order here. Okay. Daniel, uh, just a quick question. So at, at this point, in, I'm trying to follow along. The question might be silly. There's a lot going on, but um, the, at this point in time, could there be a race condition? Could multiple takers have requested the same thing and then try to, uh, you know, uh, actually materialize it, but then both of them might not have access to the liquidity? That's a really, you, you're asking really, really good questions because that is true. There, there can definitely be race conditions, right? So, you know, this is what we call front running. Right. So because the Ethereum mempool, are you familiar with what a mempool is? Yeah. Yeah. So because the Ethereum mempool is visible to everyone, right. Um, you could see some traders, what they do is they actually observe the mempool. And then when a transaction that, you know, performs a trade appears inside the mempool, they analyze that transaction. And if it's profitable, what they do is they make the same transaction but they use a higher gas price, right? So you get into like gas wars, right? And remember gas is the, the cost that you're willing to pay to execute that transaction, right? It's, it's the fee in this case. So the, your answer is yes, there definitely could be a race conditions between the time that you request a quote and you fill that quote. But zero X API allows you to use a parameter called slippage parameter. Um, and let me just show you what that looks like here on the documentation. So, um, so now we have our transaction and we're pretty much done. So we have this order. Let's say we're, we agree to fill it. Okay. The first thing we want to do is we want to create a client, right? And this is simply a, um, a class which accepts the provider as only argument. And the wrapper is effectively a class that allows us to send transactions, um, send raw transactions, transactions which were already created for us. And then we use send transaction async, and we're gonna pass in that transaction data. That's it. Cool. So let's save this and reload it. Okay, cool. So now let's, 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 let's see if that swap works. Okay. I'm going to press this button. It's going to go all the way here. It's going to log all this data, but then it's going to get that transaction data and it's going to send it on chain. So our window comes up, as you can see here, the, uh, the amount of Ethereum is already filled in for us. MetaMask also recognizes what method we're calling on the exchange. The gas fee is already set. All we have to do is confirm and wait to see. So this should be, this should basically sell our DAI for some USDC. 
and decrease the allowance if everything goes well. And it worked. There you go. So the swap worked correctly. Our allowance decremented by 100 because, again, we sold 100 die. So the 0x exchange withdrew 100 die from our account. And it performed the swap with 100 USDC. In this case, there was a one-to-one -one mapping. And let's just take a look at what this order looks like. Right? Let's just take a look at what this transaction looks like. As you can see, this transaction, this is what I mean by an atomic swap, right? Throughout this entire transaction, the Xerox exchange withdrew funds from the maker and sent them to the taker. And then withdrew funds from the taker and sent them to the maker. And only if all the conditions were met, that trade went through. If not, it would revert. And so, yeah, this is it. Um, looks like we are, um, yeah, we, it looks like we completed the assignment. So that's good. So I just want to wrap it up now because it looks like we're pretty, we're pretty uh, low on time. Um, yeah, okay, cool. So as homework, just go through the recording of this workshop and re-implement all the exchange-like functionality that we built together today. And most importantly, like, don't hesitate in contacting me uh, for anything really, like, you know, if I can be of any help, um, please let me know. If you're interested in talking about DeFi, what it's like to work in the DeFi space or zero X in general, I'd, I'd love to, I'd love to connect. And yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks for the thank workshop. You.